Uh, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the week four edition of the Pro Football Focus Fantasy Show here at Rotor Grinders. I am Britt Devine, joined by my man Ian Harditz from Pro Football Focus. Ian, what is going on? It's been a, uh, a fun season of DFS, of sports betting, of props. What, is this like our running backs? Do they really not matter anymore for our lineups? I mean, for props and all that, it's fun. But in DFS, it's really just turned into cor- having the quarterback that throws for six touchdowns or four touchdowns and runs for one, getting the receiver that catches 150 yards, 10 receptions and a touchdown or two, and insert any running back that can get a couple of touches and fits your salary. It's It's been the passing era, unless you're the Bears, has entered the NFL. <laughs> Well, the thing is, the dual threat quarterbacks have, we've always known they offer the great floor, but now these guys are like offering more passing upside than the guys like Cousins, Stafford, Rodgers, Brady, who we thought like had the superior passing upside. So the superhuman quarterbacks we're seeing, I think, is something new that we're going to see. Hey, maybe just we have to get used to really paying up more often to get that. What the wide receivers thing, though, man, like, look, Tyreek Hill was the wide receiver 73 in week three. Diggs was 32. Like, Cup was 22. Amon Ross St. Brown was 37. Like, Jamar He's Chase plugging Mac enough. Hollins and win all the money. Well, but that's my point. So, like, <laughs> yes, the running backs. I understand the running backs have busted a little bit more than these wide receivers, but I still think that week one, where all these guys, Adams, Hill, Diggs, you know, Devontae Adams, they all look like Justin Jefferson. They all look like they were going to have 150 plus yards like every single week of the year. And that has died off a little bit. So, really, it's been these superstar quarterbacks, the only constant across all the positions. Yeah, and there are a couple, we'll talk about it in the DFS segment, but there's a few receivers we like this week that are just getting those double-digit targets every week so far, and at some point, maybe they won't, but a trend is a trend. A trend is still not, it's it's not a trend, Ian, so <laughs> we'll get to all that, but uh, let's jump over into your mismatch manifesto. That's how we like to start off the show over here. Uh, we go over explosive play rate, uh, expected points added per play, battles in the trenches, all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, I always like to start off, and you start off your article with the explosive play rate. Get us big chunk yards, get us big DFS performances, get us going over our props. That's what I like to see, Ian. What are we looking at this week? Lions, Seahawks, shootout. I don't know if it's going to happen, though, anymore because we do have DeAndre Swift, and unfortunately, the sun god himself already ruled out of this one. So I'm going to sprinkle some of the Josh Reynolds, DJ Chark. Okay, but as we'll talk about more, I think TJ Hawkins is probably just going to be the main winner there. But also, like, let's just maybe take a step back on the Lions. Number two ranked scoring offense so far. Like, this has been a fun unit, but you take away the two top players. Like, there's a reason why Tampa Bay hasn't been looking very good. They don't have their top pass catchers. I mean, anticipating this Lions offense to be just, you know, a 50% version of itself, basically because they took away their two best pass catchers. So keep that in mind. Titans versus Indy is popping a little bit, which is interesting. We have seen Tannehill make some explosive plays, man. This is actually the most explosive passing game in the league on a per drop back basis. I know they don't have a ton of drop back, so it's a little bit skewed there, but against this Colts team, you know, if Indy's able to build a lead early, I wouldn't be surprised if guys like Traylon Burks, Robert Woods have a, you know, bit, bit better counting numbers when it's all said and done when we're expecting. Also seeing the Panthers O popping a little bit against the Cardinals. If they're ever going to do anything, you'd like to think it could be against this Cardinals defense. You know, we got at some point a DJ Moore bounce back incoming, but the one I'm really interested in then is Denver going to Las Vegas and just really looking like they're being set up well. Like, do we really think Russell Wilson and company are going to be the 31st ranked scoring offense for that much longer? I don't think so. Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy, Russell Wilson. This, If this is the week, Britt, when it will it be? Maybe like week five or six or something. But I'm calling it week four. Russell Wilson finally gets back to cooking something good. So no bowl of Cheerios with a hot dog thrown in it for Russell Wilson this week? Nothing that you would find at the Hardest household, that's for sure. (laughs) Yeah, we'd be going a little higher class than that. Uh, I want to talk about, so I see uh, Derrick Henry and the explosive run rate. Am I seeing this correctly on here? So I like his prop. We'll talk about that in a sec because I think the prop's really low for Derrick Henry. What are we looking at here in terms of this? Is this something I should be, am I going to be looking like a fool after this, Ian? I mean, he just hasn't – they haven't done much this year yet. Week one was a dub. Week two, he was out by the end of the third quarter against the Bills. And week three, he finally kind of got going to an extent. But that was actually in large part thanks to the five catches for 58 yards. I mean, you look at it just through three weeks, pure yards per carry, which doesn't tell the whole story, but it's what we basically care about at the end of the day regardless of how we get there. But career low, 3.6 at this point in time. Titans run game has been terrible and it really sucks because when you do have these run first offenses like Tennessee and Baltimore over
over the years, they've been able to still be really efficient despite all that running because of the guys they were giving the ball to. But this season, just through three weeks, hasn't been super kind to Henry because of that efficiency. So I still think he's going to see 20 plus rush attempts. Only takes one to get right back on track. So I'm not super sweating it. Again, this is more of a backward looking model kind of that we're going through here. So early on in the season, we are going to see more extreme spots like this where it looks like Henry, you know, won't have a chance in hell of getting going. But as we know, always just, you know, one big play away. All right, let's talk pace next. Uh, more snaps generally means more fantasy points, more less snaps. Less fantasy points in general in a game here. What are some fast-paced games? What are some slow-paced games? Yeah, fastest one of the week, Jaguars at the Eagles. It's, uh, what Over. A time to be, yeah, Over. Exactly. What a time to be alive. Jaguars, Eagles, and you know Seahawks, Lions before those injuries. Just really popping as a potential two top uh, highest scoring matches of the week. Also, Chargers and Houston is uh, clicking. So with Houston, if there was going to be a week to think that Brandon Cooks or Davis Mills or one of these guys could get something going, I think it'd be against this banged up Chargers defense uh, right now. Certainly not going to be you know too much later in the season. At the same time, I'm not sure there's been a more underwhelming offense to watch this season than whatever the hell they're doing over there in Houston. So probably overthinking that just a bit in terms of uh, really slow-paced matchups. we got the Monday night game between the Rams and 49ers, also that Titans-Colts matchup. So we'll talk more about the Colts side of things uh, in a little bit, but I do wonder, man, like last week, I was lucky enough to be on kind of the, and it wasn't a monster Derrick Henry uh, blow up game, but he had a pretty nice week. And the thought was kind of like, Hey, no one's talking about it being Derrick Henry week. Maybe it could be. I don't think enough people are talking about the chance for Jonathan Taylor to bounce back in a major way here. He didn't have the explosive games against the Jaguars or Texans. Like we used to seeing him go through every year, but this Titans defense, I mean, we saw what Saquon Barkley did to him in week one and having Jonathan Taylor at the top of the salary scale. I think you can get up there, you know, if you want to, thanks to having the guys like Jamal Williams, Khalil, Herbert and even like Joshua Palmer's of the world able to pay down at otherwise uh, other positions. So pace isn't, you know, great here for Taylor, but as we know, man, any 60 minute football game that dude has a chance to flirt with 20, 30 touches any given week. All right, let's go to pressure rate. Uh, maybe you want a, your quarterback to have a clean pocket. Maybe you're looking for that DST that can score you 20 points at low ownership. What are some offensive lines, defensive lines that could be in good or bad spots? Yeah, some of the usual suspects, Wentz, Daniel Jones, Justin Fields, probably going to be under more duress. Uh, one concerning one is Geno Smith, and I think it's enough for me to probably get off him and cash in favor of Marcus Mariota if I'm going to be paying down this week. Hey, Lions, you know, shout out Aiden Hutchinson, number two overall pick. They have been able to field one of the league's better pass rushes so far. Their coverage has been the problem. And Jeffrey Okuda has been playing great, you know, former number three overall pick in his own right, Ohio State's finest. But with Okuda last week, like he did a great job on Justin Jefferson also had a ton of safety help throughout that game. So I'm thinking that's probably going to be the strategy on DK Metcalf again, because Lockett is the one they usually put in the slot, or at least they're, I think most defenses usually view Metcalf as the number one over Lockett. And the one other thing we've seen when Okuda is not guarding these guys, that's Amani Aruwarie, such a tough name. I kind of got it on the second time. But Amani this year got absolutely torched by A.J. Brown in week one. He missed week two with a back injury, played through the pain last week, and then we saw what happened with Adam Thielen uh, cashing in that anytime touchdown prop that a certain someone told you guys about. So I think we could have a situation where Tyler Lockett is getting the feast on two of PFF's bottom 12 corners throughout this one again high scoring potential environment even though geno smith in this offensive line could have some problems i'm far less confident in the line secondary holding up in this matchup yeah i know lockett was getting some love on scores and odds and i know the blitz loves geno smith this week so the passing game of seattle uh is certainly looking interesting if this pressure doesn't hold hold through maybe geno is there i know people are going to be playing geno smith in dfs we'll talk about that in just a little bit but just uh i know the, the Seattle offense is pretty high on a couple of things here at Roto-Grinders. Uh, you want to talk about the trenches? What's looking good for some running backs? Anything standing? Jam it looks like Jamal Williams looks like he's about to go ham this week. Yeah, it's just so tough to get off him at that price. I, last year, we did see three games without DeAndre Swift, but with Jamal Williams and the snaps weren't exactly where he wanted him to be. He was actually like under 50% in a few of those games. But that's because Jamal Williams was also hurt during that stretch. So they still found a way in those games to get him up around nearly 20 touches each and every time. So the problem for the Lions last year was that they just didn't score enough points. And this year, even if they are going to take a slight step back, you know, without a Monra, without DeAndre Swift, still a second rank scoring offense after three weeks of action. So got to love Jamal Williams. One pivot I think I love off those chalky running backs, though, 
in terms of just more of a GPP play. Ezekiel Elliott set up really well against this Washington defense that as they continue to not have Chase Young back, you know, they just aren't quite the same beast that we've seen in, in past years, at least in the front seven. So Zeke, Looking good, like, you know, fair enough. We still see Tony Pollard, you know, cracking the longer explosive plays. But I think relative to some of the versions of Zeke we've seen in here in past years, Zeke looks fine out there. And this Cowboys offense with Cooper Rush is standing up a bit better than we expected. So the Cowboys and, you know, to a larger extent, the Colts, you know, we do have these home favorites where maybe we're not paying quite enough uh, to the uh, attention to the starting running back there. So Zeke, if the Cowboys are able to put Washington in the sort of hole that we've really seen them being forced to play out of all season long, with the exception of that first week one game against the Jaguars, where they built a nice lead, I think we could look up and see Zeke, you know, potentially having multiple trips to the end zone. Give me Curtis Samuel. Maybe I'll replace my prop bet that I really liked with something else uh, on Curtis Samuel. A couple more ding and dunk, duck, dunk offs to him uh, <laughs> sound really good. It's been happening every single week. Uh, let's go to uh, you want to do the combined yards for drop back. Which quarterbacks uh, are, are having some big time throws here? Yeah, just uh, quickly, Detroit, Philly, Buffalo set up the best, some of the better passing games we've seen this year. Washington, Arizona, Chicago, not quite so much. So, again, though, Arizona, to me, it's a matter of when, not if they get this corrected, uh, at least to a decent extent. I think they're hopefully getting Rondale Moore back this week. He's been practicing. So, A.J. Green's leaving the picture. Like, that might actually be a net positive for the offense uh, at this point. So, as much as we, you know, deservedly have been talking about Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, and Jalen Hurts, really, as you know, the top tier of these quarterbacks when Kyler Murray is at his fantasy best man like he is arguably even has a higher ceiling than all those guys probably again probably not but he's right there in that conversation like when he is at his best so with Kyler I know he hasn't been running but he hasn't been running until he has to start running maybe just maybe this is the week where we see that happen against a good Panthers defense with all due respect to guys like Brian Burns and you know a limited Dante Jackson right now but certainly not one that I think should be able to limit Kyler all that much when he's really clicking all right, and then let's round this out. Uh, let's go to combined EPA per play. Anything standing out? either DFS or maybe even sports betting that we can take a look at this week. Yeah, the uh, the dogs, like underdogs with a, an offensive advantage has been kind of the early season trend we've talked about l- last few years and had some success with us. And last week they went three and one straight up money line picks even, didn't even need to spread uh, the EPA dogs. So this week, uh, Dolphins plus three and a half. I mean, we saw what happened with Tua. So unfortunate, you know, prayers up. Saints plus three, so the QB change. But the three that do, I think, make sense to me. The Bears plus three against the Giants. Like, I get it. The Bears probably shouldn't be favored but i don't know that daniel jones shouldn't really be favored against anyone either the jaguars plus six and a half against the eagles i don't know about the money line there but that does seem like a pretty big number for against the jaguars team that hey they've been smacking everyone these past two weeks man and so have the eagles but don't you know don't discount the potential for these jaguars to make this one a bit closer than that touchdown spread and find the broncos at two and a half i just don't think that Derek Carr and his raiders team have done anything to sort of warrant being two and a half point favorites over it's been ugly, but over the first place, Denver Broncos, who, again, I think are going to have a way to uh, get that passing game back on track this week. So Bears plus three, Jaguars plus six and a half, Broncos plus two and a half. Maybe just maybe those lines still a little bit wide based on what we see in the first three weeks. EPA per play, strike down on that Eagles game. We'll talk about that one in just a second, at least in my view. I'm, I like the Eagles quite a bit uh, from a sports betting perspective. I like the over in that game, too. Maybe I could just switch to that. There we go. We'll get to, we'll get to that. Uh, again, if you guys ever want to read this more in depth, get access to not only this, but everything else at Pro Football Focus. Uh, you can get a subscription over there. Ian, the suits would not let him allow this to be free this year. The information <laughs> is too good, so it is behind the paywall. But, Ian, we appreciate you coming on each and every week and sharing it for the people. Uh, all right, let's jump into some props. Uh, let's start with maybe our spreads or over-unders. And, Ian, I've got the strangest line going this year. I got two wins, two losses, and two pushes. I mean, <laughs> I got to I, I want to win or lose. I don't want – I don't have a sister, but I don't want to kiss my sister – and have like a ties, right? I, I need the I need the three and a half line. I need a four and a half prop, right? I just I need to win or lose. I don't like the ties. But anyway, uh, a couple lines I'm looking at first off is uh, one of my major bets is going to be Minnesota. So it's the London game this week. So they mm-hmm. lost Jameis, no Michael Thomas. It's basically I don't know. I would consider this a, a neutral field, and it's a three points. I think the Vikings with you know Jameis. He has his ups and downs, but he's definitely a pro for that offense with the emergence of Olave and Michael Thomas back. And you've got Dink and Dunk 
Andy Dalton back here. You're going to see a lot of Kamara in this game, but I just think the Vikings are a much, much better team and basically a neutral field. And you get a couple of London stats too. So over the past couple of years since London's been involved, uh, since 2007, just blindly betting favorites, either straight up on a money line or against the spread has really been profitable. Uh, 18 and 12 against the spread and then 21, eight and one straight up. Uh, so I've got the Vikings minus three. I just think they're the much more explosive offense. Da Dalvin Cook, I don't know if they, they put some of that sports tape on his shoulder. They strapped him up. He's ready to go. Uh, but this looks like one of my favorite bets of the week. It is the early game, so don't wake up Sunday at noon or whatever like that and expect to get this in. Uh, just make sure to get it in. I like the Vikings game. Uh, Vikings minus three is the one spread I'm going with. What do, you, what do you think of that one? I just think the I didn't really see the line move too much with with Jameis out and Michael Thomas I, Those guys, see, the, like they got to be worth three points alone. In my opinion. This is already a Saints team that really hasn't looked good for, at any point no. this season. So like even week one, they got that late comeback win against the Falcons, but they were getting smacked there. I mean, to lose the way they did against the Panthers, like this line should be much further in my opinion. Yeah, so I like that one. Uh, what are a couple games you're looking at, and then I'll throw a couple more of mine out. I got three dogs this week and you know, already talked a little bit about the reasons for the Broncos over the Raiders, but yeah, plus two and a half. Like, if anything, it should be a pick them. So I'll gladly take uh, the extra points there. Cardinals over the Panthers, just Baker Mayfield being, I don't care if he's home, being a favorite over anyone at this point. I thought it was just like almost their defense did him a disservice last week winning that game. Let's get Matt Rule out of here. I'm still not convinced this team has really much to play for on a week-by-week -week basis. And finally, the Ravens plus three at home against the Bills. You know, a little bit of a tough one, but Lamar Jackson has a three-point home dog. Man, you look at that Bills secondary. I don't think they can slow down anyone at this moment. Like, they just had to bring in Xavier freaking Rhodes, old man Xavier Rhodes. He's off out, the street. too. They already and now he's <laughs> out. Their, their emergency replacement got hurt. So it really is just like a laundry list of these injuries. You know, Tredavious White and Micah Hyde, we know those are the big ones that are, you know, still out for the foreseeable future. Hyde the entire season. White's still on um, pup. But literally, man, three, four different corners. Jordan Poyer still hurt as well and you know lost in that josh allen performance against the dolphins and i know you know bills mafia love you guys but hey josh allen had the great counting stats last week he had like three dropped interceptions and like that game really i, I know that we we like to say that the bills you know really should have won that one and hey more accurate pass to isaiah mckenzie and they probably would have at the end but at the same time really erratic performance from josh allen and i think the Ravens secondary is getting a little bit healthier uh than they have been so three points for lamar jackson my opinion, it's tough to say anyone's playing better than Jalen Hurts right now, but Lamar, man, if anyone, he's right there with them at least. So Ravens plus three, Broncos plus two and a half, Cardinals plus one. Great day to be great. All right. I do want to note that Bills game, Roth has that as orange. There's supposed to be, as it stands right now, anything can happen by Sunday. Yeah. But as it stands right now, 20 mile per hour sustained winds, gusts higher, and the possibility of some rain in that game right now. So just keep that in mind. Uh, from a DFS slash sports betting perspective, some major, major weather impact on that game looks like it's likely, especially maybe for kickers and in the deep passing game. The Bills throwing a little bit more, a lower ADOT this year, not as aggressive down the field. So maybe that can, you know, Stefan Diggs can get open against anybody in the short field and Allen could rip it through anybody. And Lamar's having a great season, but uh, I just did want to know that looks like the one main weather game we're going to have to pay attention to on the weekend. Uh, another game, so I'm going against you in the EPA per play. I like the Eagles minus six and a half, uh, and I got another bet for you with the Eagles in just a second that I actually couldn't believe the line when I saw it earlier in the week. Uh, the Eagles are six and a half. I just think they're, they're the best team in football as it looks right now. Offensive, defensively, they're healthy, Ian. Uh, I know the EPA per play was against me. I know the Jags have looked good, but this is in Philadelphia – you know, maybe Peterson going back, maybe he coaches up his team. Does like a co can a coach revenge <laughs> against his former team through the players? Well, I don't know if that's all going to manifest in the field. Until the Eagles prove to me they're not easily the best team in the NFC, and I'd argue, you know, the best, second best, third best team in football, uh, I'm willing to take them against anyone not named the Bills or uh, I don't know the Chiefs or the Ravens like that. Uh, Less than a touchdown favorite at home. So it's six and a half right now. If it gets to seven, I know there's a lot of people, and I know you, you're the EPA per play sort of like the Jags, and I know there are people that like the Jags this week. I just think the Eagles are so good. I'm willing to take that six and a half. Uh, and you can use the – I like the money line too if you're parlaying with something like the Packers or I, I mentioned I like the Vikings or any of yours as well. 
you know, if you take one of these, I like the Packers, especially as a big money line favorite, but it's so big. I, I don't really want to talk about it, but if you we take one of your, them. yeah, if you, or you can do that. Or if you take one of your dog plays with the Packers money line or the Eagles, you can really get some, some nice odds and, and things like that. Uh, but I just think the Eagles are so good. I'm willing to take that six and a half offensive defense or PFF's number one ranked offense, or I think number one ranked team. Uh, so I, I'm willing to take that without question, the six and a half. And I, I like the look of headlines. Uh, the Chiefs one that didn't really work out. I had them at minus one, and I think they're either a pick them or minus one or plus one. Uh, looks like almost like a pick them right now against the Buccaneers. I gave that to you. So really no, no win or lose. But Ian, the Eagles are minus three and a half in Arizona next week. And this makes absolutely no sense to me. They're P PF Eagles, PFF's number one graded team. Arizona PFF's 31st graded team. Three and a half. I don't care if it's on the road. And if, if just imagine if Arizona doesn't, if they struggle or barely win this game, this could be a touchdown line by the time it comes out on Sunday. Yeah. And if the, I like the Eagles to win, so maybe I'm a little biased, but as a look ahead line, Eagles minus three and a half, you can get that on FanDuel. I think it was minus four on DraftKings. Uh, just looks like really nice line if you can sort of extrapolate a week ahead. I put that up on scores and odds. Uh, I'll mention on on here, but I always like the look ahead lines. Uh, I think you can get some really good value. So make sure to, uh, incorporate those into your sports betting uh, arena. Uh, let's go to some props. You can use these for both DFS and in the sports books. Uh, I'm, I, I like the kicker props. So on, on scores and odds, I threw out Evan McPherson. I did Evan McPherson last week. Every week. Every week. Every, right Evan right McPherson every week is going to kick two field goals until the sports books. So I hit that on Thursday. I'm running it right back with Daniel Carlson of the Raiders over one and a half. Uh, I think it was just like minus 113 on Caesars, minus 115 on DraftKings. He's hit it over 75% of the time since the start of, uh, or I think 73% of the time since the start of 2020. So a very long history of going over this. He's hit at least, he's gone over this all three games this season. And in five of his last six games, he's attempted at least three field goals. So that gives you the margin of error. And I know you like the Broncos, but I, I, I sort of like the Broncos too, but that's good for Carlson because the Broncos defense is good enough and the Raiders offense is good enough that you can get, uh, you can move the ball, but you get some stalled drives and that really sets up good. That's worked for McPherson. That's worked for Carlson all season long. And I'm going to go right back to it. I like his prop over one and a half field goals. Uh, that has to be one of my favorite ones currently on the board. Uh, what are a couple ones you're looking at? I'll throw in a, uh, I got a Derrick Henry prop, and uh, I'm going to ad lib and throw in a Curtis Samuel prop in just a second as well. Going back to the anytime touchdown, well, we called Mike Evans in week one, Adam Thielen week three. I, I, I either missed or I don't remember what we got in week two. Week four, though, Tyler Lockett plus 210 over at FanDuel to score a touchdown. Talked earlier about the projected matchup there going up against Amani, who, again, has just been a mixture of bad and roasted. Also looking at Mike Hughes in the slot. That has been the best place to attack. The league's single worst scoring defense in the Detroit Lions so far through three weeks of this season. So love the chance for Lockett to find his way into the end zone. Also taking Lamar Jackson over one and a half passing touchdowns mentioned all those Buffalo Bills injuries so far this year 12 quarters 12 touchdowns for Lamar Jackson 10 of those through the air so plus 130 over at points bet for that over one and a half passing touchdowns for Lamar love that regardless of how this game goes I don't think the you know Ravens are gonna be able to run the ball because they haven't been able to run the ball all season long so throwing all game against that banged up secondary signed me up and also Love this one, man. Travis Etienne over only 17 and a half receiving yards. Like this year, the top two running backs in yards per catch are Etienne and DeAndre Swift. That's kind of been my comp for Etienne since the summer. Not because they play the exact same way, but because with Etienne, I was hoping for about 50% of the backfield's rushing work, maybe a little bit less, and a bunch of comeback mode late game targets, like the stuff that basically has been the only reason why Austin Eckler is surviving this year, because I thought the Jaguars were going to be really bad. They have not been really bad bad this year they've actually been really good and that's led to everyone thinking that james robinson has completely taken over this backfield when in reality they've won by 24 and 28 points over the past two weeks those are the exact games we should expect robinson to go get his week one when the jaguars had to come back and like play a legit competitive game where they were trailing against washington etn out snapped james robinson so etn really is the guy that they still want to throw the ball to he's looked explosive as hell out there i think it's a matter of when not if he's going to start breaking off some big explosive plays in the passing game just 17 and a half receiving yards. I mean, I think you can get that in one or two, 
no problem at all. And accordingly, James Robinson under 69 and a half rushing and receiving yards. He's been ripping off these big runs. Bit unsustainable though, man. I don't want to take away the big plays. I hate when people do that. You know, he only averages two yards per carry without all the 50 yard runs. Well, it's like he made the 50 yard run. So let's not forget that happened. But in this matchup against the Eagles, I think he's going to have a tougher matchup than he's been dealing with in the front seven. And talking about what I just did with the game script and ETN, I don't think Robinson's going to be having as many touches as usual. So ETN over 17 and a half receiving yards. James Robinson under 69 and a half rushing and receiving yards. Lamar Jackson over one and a half passing touchdowns. And Tyler Lockett scoring a damn touchdown. Got anything to say to Bat? I, I left you speechless, Britt. Speechless. That's how good they were. Well, while Britt is frozen, I'll just take over the show, do my thing. Let's start and get a little DFS talk, guys. Fun slate going on. Was working on the cash game build you know, before we got going here. And the big question we immediately got to ask ourselves is like, do we want to actually pay up for the Josh Allen or the Lamar Jackson or the Jalen Hurts or pay down? It has been a situation this season, like we talked about at the start of the show, that if you don't get one of these high priced quarterbacks, you know, we haven't been able to kind of make up for it. But with the two kind of matchups down in the mid 5K range, you know, Marcus Mariota going up against a Browns defense that isn't bad by any stretch of the imagination, but you take away Miles Garrett and your Davian Clowney potentially, that's what I'm going to be fine going to Marcus Mariota at just 5.6K. So if Miles Garrett and Clowney are out, I am going to be going down to Mariota there. Talk a little bit before about some of the pressure stuff facing Geno Smith. That's my only issue there. and We just don't really have the same rushing floor with Geno as we do with Marcus Mariota. So you don't need to stack Mariota, but I think I want to with Drake London at 6.1K. Does seem like he's going to be pretty pretty chalky as well. So I think in cash games, that is more than fine sticking just with the cast on it. Before we get into some tournament talk, I do think at running back, I mean, Khalil Herbert and Jamal Williams, just eat it. You know, they're at such affordable prices, 5.7 K for Khalil Herbert on DraftKings, 6.1 K for Jamal Williams. They're going to be the two highest known backs on the slate in all likelihood. And accordingly, let's just, you know, worry about beating folks on the other side of things. Cause this salary relief here, just too much to give away. So Jamal Williams and Khalil Herbert locking them in the running back spots. Some more, some more value that we can get before we actually talk about the flex and final wide receiver spots. So again, I do like the idea currently of putting Drake London there alongside Mariota and then Joshua Palmer sitting there at just 5K. We still need these injuries uh, to come out and everything, but really when you look at this Chargers offense, Palmer's been doing a great job scoring touchdowns. He almost had 100 yards last week without Keenan Allen in the picture, and that's been the case going back to last year. So Keenan Allen yesterday on Thursday had to leave practice with a trainer, so he was only listed as limited, but sure doesn't sound like things were getting better for him to be out there. So if we can get Palmer at just 5K out going up against this you know, burnable Texan secondary, I will sign up for that. And on the other side of things, Mike Williams in tournaments, coming off that one catch performance what did he do the week before that he balled the hell out and everyone was loving him so you know let's try to expand our you know memory with these guys longer than just what happened last week i think both palmer and mike williams are viable plays but again palmer at 5k in cash especially with keenan allen now i'm fine to go to and that's also like jalen guyton now the picture as well so guyton is on ir for the season palmer had already kind of beat out guyton this year for the definitive number three wide receiver spot with that said you know Guyton really is someone he had the long catch last week on a Herbert off platform throw 50 yards we remember the incredible touchdown last year that Herbert threw against the Giants that was the Guyton too like he really was their main field stretcher even if he wasn't playing a ton so if we can now look at having you know 50 to 80 air yards per game now going to Josh Palmer or Mike Williams because unless they sign you know my guy Will Fuller between now and Sunday I just don't think they're going to have too many other options so so Similar sentiment for DeAndre Carter. I mean, he's going to be out there a ton. He does only cost 4000 Not so much in the Carter for cash, but it might be a little sneaky GPP play if you're just looking for someone to help fill out a roster and don't have that much money. So again, first kind of crack at the cash build. Mariota and Drake London getting that Falcon stack against a banged up Browns defense. Jamal Williams and Khalil Herbert taking advantage of the pricing discounts on these two handcuffs. DeAndre Swift already out. David Montgomery expecting him to be out, but yes, this is contingent on both those guys being out of the picture. Talked about adding Joshua Palmer. Basically all taking advantage of injury cash game lineup we got going on right now. Joshua Palmer assuming Keenan Allen is out. 
the one guy that we don't have to worry about any injuries with is going to be Evan Ingram at 3.4K with the Jaguars going up against the Eagles. Again, talked about the potential for this game to shoot out. And Evan Ingram just has all the sort of underlying metrics that we're looking for in terms of usage. I thought he scored a touchdown last week. Like if you guys saw the play, there were really three instances where it was DeAndre Carter, Evan Ingram, and T Higgins. Like they all had touchdowns that ended up getting overturned. But like, I just still, I've lost the plays a hundred times. and I really thought they were scores. So if Ingram had had that, you know, touchdown in the back of the end zone, they ruled that he had his two feet in. I really don't think that he would be being priced at just 3.4 K right now. So there are, you know, some other options at tight end, but I don't really want to pay up all the way to Andrews this week at 7.1K. David Njoku at 3.7K is reasonable if you want to go with him over Ingram, okay. You got to make sure that he's okay, though, in his own right, because Njoku did pop up on the injury report Thursday with a knee injury, and he didn't practice. So even if he is questionable going to this game, like we saw this with Hayden Hurst uh, last night and the week before, he ended up getting the late game touchdown to kind of save his ass, but we see these tight ends when they get banged up, not always play that every snap role that we really do need Njoku to have in an offense that's going to keep Harrison Bryant involved and, you know, first and foremost, go through Amari Cooper. So I think the Njoku play is a little point chasey, especially considering that injury that he's playing with. So Evan Ingram at 3.4K is going to be my cash game uh, tight end of choice. If you do want to pivot off that, I do think going down just $100 to Logan Thomas could make some sense in tournament land. So Cheap defense of the week, I do think, should be the Tennessee Titans going up against Matt Ryan and the Colts offense. That They've literally been the worst offense in the league this season in terms of EPA per play. I don't think they'll be there by the time the end of the season comes along, but anytime you can get just any defense at 2.5K playing against technically what you could call the worst offense in the entire league, I will be signing up for that. So when you look at, you know, the other guys only cheaper than the Titans, we got the Ravens facing the Bills. I'm out. Texas playing the Chargers. I'm out. Seattle facing Detroit. Reasonable. But man, this Seattle defense is rough. I think the Titans at their core can still be a good to pretty damn good defense. Like that's one box we're trying to check. We want the bad offense and then we want prefer for them to be home. I don't think that Seattle – even if Detroit isn't quite as good without Amonra, you know, and without DeAndre Swift are going to be there. And then Jaguars against the Eagles, Patriots against the Packers. Don't want anything to do with that. Before I throw it back on over to Britt here, now coming live, looks like from a cell phone or something, uh, that does leave a ton of salary still on the table. So I can get up to Jonathan Taylor at 8.8K and still have enough room uh, to fill out that wide receiver spot, you know, with someone like C.D. Lamb. Britt, I guess the final two by two in cash games that I'm struggling Struggling with is like Jonathan Taylor and CD Lamb, or going up to Stefan Diggs and then coming back down a little bit lower to uh, who was it? Oh, yeah, I'd have to go Diggs and Pittman or Jonathan Taylor and CD Lamb. Who sounds better, you know, to you? Well, first off, I just want to say my my the sports bets are so hot. <laughs> someone had uh, someone took out the cable at my house, there's no cable. There's no internet. There's no nothing. So we're now we're going from the basement with a cell phone. So I appreciate uh, if this doesn't sound great or if my service drops again, uh, I want to apologize for that. But Ian, the, the takes are just are just so hot. And I, are you on running backs or wide receivers here? I was I just went through the kind of whole cash game lineup to start. So we'll get to our GPP stuff in a second. But we kind of had the same, just to kind of quickly recap, we kind of had the same thoughts on cash. I'm with you on going down to Mariota, preferring him over Geno Smith. Contingent on, though, like Miles Garrett, Andrew Davian, and Clowney are both questionable. If we take them out of the picture, that's going to be a lot better for Mariota. I think you can stack them with Drake London. Running back, cash, yeah, we're going down to Khalil Herbert and Jamal Williams. Britt does bring up Josh Jacobs. He is also too cheap and someone that if you don't want to go all the way up and you know we do have to if like if we get off of Mariota then I do think Josh Jacobs makes a lot of sense here uh and then tight end I'm with you on Evan Ingram so I just have a lot of money left on those two spots so again Jonathan Taylor and CeeDee Lamb or Diggs and Pittman that's gonna keep me up uh keep me up these next two nights hold on I'm I'm, I'm going outside I gotta get on that 5g <laughs> Brits, I do, as Brits doing his thing, I do think that you know going with Taylor. Oh crap! I do have Taylor. With the we're going out of tour of the house here. That does not make sense to me. Okay, I'm now leaning more Diggs and Pittman to complete that cash game show. But you know what? We still got some time to uh, figure that out before Sunday morning, luckily. So, Britt, let's move things over to a little bit of GPP talk now because there really are a lot of different directions you're you're able to go this week. You know, looking at quarterback, I do think that 
Russ could finally be in his get right spot and Kyler Murray and those Cardinals as well. So again, I've been talking up the Cardinals and the Broncos, you know, most of the show already, some of the bets and other things that we have going on. So, Hey, Kyler, again, he's not getting the same respect as these other guys because of a three week sample size. And I have seen the rushing numbers and that's fine. I, I do believe that Kyler isn't someone that wants to run the ball 10, 12 times per game. Doesn't mean he still isn't one of the fastest guys on the field. Doesn't mean he can't bust this one big one. I mean, he played the Panthers a couple years ago and I remember he took one up the middle for like 60 yards. So, you know, Kyler isn't rushing a lot until he does. Don't be afraid to continue to, you know, just hopefully ride that bounce back. Moving on to some of the running backs. Talked about Ezekiel Elliott, home favorite. Right now, Britt, you're breaking up, man. Your connection is terrible. I'm just going to keep rolling. Uh, Zeke is a home favorite right next to Jamal Williams. I think it just makes some sense to, hey, you know, we're not going to be perfect. And when you have a running back as chalky as Jamal Williams is shaping up to be on this slate, you know, pivoting someone right next to him, we're just naturally going to have a lot more opportunity there. So Ezekiel Elliott, just 6,100 at home against Washington. I think it makes a lot of sense. And you can make a similar case for Miles Sanders. I mean, we talk about this Eagles and Jaguars game just being something that could really be shooting out from all angles, why not pay a little bit of attention to Miles Sanders, who seemingly will benefit from uh, Boston Scott not playing this week with a rib injury. So Miles Sanders, even if you want to, you know, you kind of game well, truthers out there, you know, everything I said about Travis Etienne, maybe, you know, benefiting from some uh, negative game script also could apply to Kenneth Gamewell and the uh, Eagles offense if Trevor Lawrence and the Jaguars happen to get up. So the two pivots that I really like in this Jaguars Eagles matchup, everyone's focusing on the wide receivers and the quarterbacks and all that looking at, you know, Travis Etienne and Kenneth Gamewell and just under the impression where, Hey, what if either of these offenses get up? I think both those running backs have the ability to make their, make the most out of, you know, five to seven catches and on a full PPR site like DraftKings going to be tough to say no to that. Also, Ramondre Stevenson, just 5.2K right now. Pretty awesome role, you know, in New England. We've had a lot to go to get here, guys. I mean, the amount of just sleeper articles with Ramondre Stevenson this offseason, nauseating in my humble opinion at certain points of time because so much had to go right. But here we are in week four, and basically all that stuff has gone right. James White retired. Ty Montgomery is on IR. J.J. Taylor and Kevin Harris out of the picture on the practice squad. Pierre Strong hurt his shoulder early in the season. He's just not getting the chance to go out there so all that happened now here we are Damian Harris and Ramondre Stevenson the only two running backs involved in New England at this point so always a chance it could change you know we just as soon as we think we know what's going on with Bill Belichick and the Patriots offense you know he's quick to kind of pull the rug up from under us but with Ramondre people aren't on him really because of the potential switch the likely switch from Mac Jones to Brian Hoyer although he did see Mac Jones at practice there so no I'm not expecting much out of this offense you know with a severely limited Mac Jones or a perfectly healthy Brian Hoyer under center but Ramondre Stevenson man if he has the usage and the profile of a legitimate RB1 and he's available at 5,200, like I just think in a week, if we didn't have Khalil Herbert and if we didn't have Jamal Williams, we'd be much more willing to go down to Ramondre Stevenson here. So yeah, the matchup isn't ideal, but hey, it's a running back. We follow the volume. Don't be afraid to get down to Ramondre Stevenson 5.2K. So again, favorite GPP running backs of the week, Zico Elliott getting off that chalky Jamal Williams as a home favorite in his own right. Travis Etienne, Kenneth game well respectively in two running back backfields now with no boss and Scott. And I just think if either the Eagles or the Jaguars get up, we can see them catching some passes and Ramondre Stevenson with an awesome role that hasn't been priced into it yet. Britt, you're back in your lovely, not real living room, but you got the internet. There we yes, go. I think someone crashed a car into a power line and took everything out. The five, the five G from Verizon wasn't cutting it outside. So they're getting canned. And uh, lo looks like whatever happened, uh, I'm back. I'm back on the air now. Sorry about that. <laughs> you are good, sir. We're just talking GPP. I got through my GPP running backs. Who do you like this week? Oh, well, you got the three like min price ones. You've got what? Jamal Williams. You've got Herbert and you've got Josh Jacobs. That's cash though. I mean, yeah, well, th that's going to translate into a lot. I think overall as a build, it really, I don't know. I guess I had a whole spiel. I was going to talk about how, how, which quarterback you select, right? Between if you go the high price quarterback or you go with Gino or Mariota, those seem to be like the popular quarterbacks. It really depends what that really dictates what the rest of your roster is going to do, because then you can either go with a, one cheap wide receiver or maybe two to get up to your Jonathan Taylor, your Christian McCaffrey, right? Those type of players. But I don't know. I just think like if 
is if Austin Eckler doesn't do it this week, is he ever going to do it? Uh, and I don't think anyone's going to going to be really playing him. I don't know. I think running back is uh, it's just to me the position I'm filling in last based off this season's results through a couple of weeks. You got to have that quarterback that goes bananas. You got to have these wide receivers that score 25, 30 plus. You got to have a couple of them. And people are getting by outside of Mark Andrews last week with tight ends that get single digit fantasy points with running backs that barely crap or cap, you know, crack 10 to 15 fantasy points. So my focus is more on, on trying to get that quarterback wide receiver, you know, combo of the high scoring players in there and just fit in whichever there's so many mid tier running backs. There's three or four of them that you can fit in this week. And I'm just trying to focus on the rest. There's a ton of mid-tier wide receivers as well. So just as we kind of say every week, an easy way if you want to just differentiate your lineup in tournaments, go against the grain for what the easiest roster construction is. This week, the easiest roster construction is a bunch of mid-priced players around probably a high-priced quarterback. So, hey, pay for a mid-priced quarterback and then pay really far up at running back and then, you know, get going to the dumpster there for some wide receivers. Just some easy ways to differentiate that old lineup. Because, yeah, moving on now, the wide receiver. Just looking at the options in the 5K range, man, like Brandon Cooks and DJ Moore, yeah. two guys that are absolutely overdue to come back and have these bounce-back performances. Rashad Bateman going up against, again, an incredibly banged-up Bill secondary, just 5.6K. And I've already talked about Tyler Lockett and the anytime touchdown bet I love for him. Final note, don't underestimate this Chargers passing game, man. I am not at all convinced that Keenan Allen's going to play. And if he does, that he's going to be back anywhere close to 100%. So, Mike Williams, 7K without Keenan Allen. Like I saw last week, he had one catch. The week before, he was over 100 yards and a touchdown, almost scored two touchdowns out there. So, Mike Williams is a boomer bust wide receiver. We're trying to win a million dollars. That's the exact type of player we should be trying to go to. Don't be afraid to get up to Mike Williams. And I talked about Josh Palmer already. I will say, though, Britt, I'm looking at some of your cash game come on man there's so much better options these detroit wide receivers or richie james i don't want to do that it's supposed richie, to be fun richie i like well, james De- deontay's deontay's got to be like the top of the mid-tier wide receivers for you with all those targets going up against the jets that looks pretty juicy i'm sure you talked to a couple of the others guys i want to circle back to your tyler lockett bat because i did that i hit that in the sports book and then my whole world went out here in terms of the power <laughs> i'm, I'm going to run through a couple of players. This is on FanDuel plus two ten. I bet that immediately because these are the players, according to FanDuel, more likely to score a touchdown than Tyler Lockett this week from that same game. Are you ready? Yes. Khalif Raymond is more is more likely to score a touchdown than Tyler Lockett in this game. Josh Reynolds, Quintez Cephas is more likely to score a touchdown according to FanDuel. It's a broken For, line. Craig, Craig Reynolds is plus one sixty five to get Tyler Lockett a plus two ten. People got to go bet that right now. That is ridiculous, man. <laughs> I, I saw the, uh, I, I almost wanted to get really bold and do like the two plus touchdown because that one's like plus 17 or 1800 or something. Yeah, like, really, no respect for Tyler Lockett. Yeah, so you play some Lock and DFS. Uh, I, I like for tournaments, give me like a, a Christian Kirk, a Cortland Sutton. Sutton's just balling out each and every week. And if you like Denver, uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Is, if Russ is going to cook, you got to think Sutton's the guy. He's, he's the one catching all these deep balls from Russell Wilson, seems to have the chemistry. And it, maybe it's not so much Judy and Sutton. Maybe it's just going to be Cortland Sutton with Judy as the ancillary piece is, is how that's really going. But I just don't think this week isn't a pay up at wide receiver week. I'm looking at the highest percentage owned on Roto Grinders right now. So Richie James topping out. Richie James is almost 20% owned currently right now, Ian. Uh, at, at 4K because there's no one else to catch balls. And that's a salary relief spot to get Jalen Hurts or Stephon Diggs or Josh Allen, right? So people are using that. And then it's all these mid-tier guys, Deontay Johnson, Drake London, Tyler Lockett, CeeDee Lamb. You can mix in A.J. Brown and Stephon Diggs, and then it's Brandon Cooks and Curtis Samuel and Cortland Sutton. So it this isn't a pay-up at wide receiver week. It seems like the preferred roster construction is pick your quarterback – Pick some of the mid-tier running backs. Pick your favorite mid-tier wide receivers. Pick your favorite mid-tier tight end. Pick your favorite defense and go at it. So doing something different, you know, if you play a Devontae Adams or you play uh, Michael Pittman, right, who's just done it each and every week, he's been healthy. These guys are coming in low owned, can offer monster ceilings. I think that's where you probably look. If everyone's going to the roster construction of mid-tier running backs, mid-tier wide receivers, insert X quarterback, insert X tight end. I think that's a way to get different. 
I would rather play both DeAndre Carter, who's also 4K, and oh. Zay and Zay Jones. The Jones practice, yeah, I was looking. At I know it. That's we, we, big. Need, we need to make sure on that. But Zay Jones for sure over Richie James at just four point two. If you can get up to it, and DeAndre Carter, man, if Keenan Allen again, if Keenan Allen is out, DeAndre Carter is going to be in three wide receiver sets with Justin Herbert. I'll take that mm-hmm. over. Well, like, come on, it's the Giants passing game. I feel like this is the easiest trap call ever. It's Richie freaking James, man. Come on. I know we had the huge Thursday night game three years ago, but. We'll see where it ends up by the time Sunday rolls around. But currently, he is the highest projected own wide receiver, according to the uh, Roto Grinders uh, projections currently. We'll see if that sticks. Uh, but yeah, I, I love. What, did you say anything about Deontay Johnson, at least from the cash game perspective? He's not really, man. Like, I don't think, I mean, Sauce Gardner and the Jets, we just saw what they were able to do against the Bengals last week, not making life that mm-hmm. easy uh, for them. And yeah, I, I guess they did have a good first half, but I, I don't know, man. It's still Mitch Trubisky under center there. I don't think anything's a given with Deontay Johnson uh, out there. So very good talent, but just like in terms of needing to get on him versus other guys, I'd rather take Drake London uh, straight up over Deontay this week. Yeah, and then C.D. Lamb, it's not a reach to get to him. You like him at 6,700. Just these all, like, I guess I'm coming at it from the perspective of target hogs is Deontay Johnson and C.D. Lamb are currently those those dudes for the team right now. Yeah, and you won't freaking answer my question. Jonathan Taylor and C.D. Lamb or Stefan Diggs and Michael Pittman. It's keep keep me up at night. Keep me up at night. Give me, give me that second one for, for a tournament. I think that sounds yeah. pretty juicy. For a tournament, yeah, yeah that's a good call. Yeah, give me that one. Uh, let's go to tight end. We'll wrap up the show before someone else uh, takes out my power because it takes a two. I, I want to circle back real quick. A couple props I'm on. I like Derrick Henry over 70 and a half rush yards. I think that's just a little bit so, too low. I know all of Ian's stuff he had at the beginning of the show are anti-Titans run game, but I'm just hoping Derrick Henry has it in him. 70 and a half, historically way, 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 way too low of a line for a guy like Derrick Henry getting all the work. So I like him. And I'm going to throw in an ad lib of Curtis Samuel, uh, over four and a half receptions, crushed it each and every week. Why can't he do it again? He seems you can take his rushing yards too. It was eight and a half. Now I think it's up to ten and a half. But he's crushing that every game too. He is involved in this Washington offense. Uh, so those were a couple of prop bets. Uh, tight end. Uh, let's see. You know, if if Zay Jones doesn't make it, or is this Evan Ingram week? Is it T.J. Blockinson week? He, they're going to actually have to unleash him in the pass game a little bit. What are we doing here? Because I think the the cheapish tight end is certainly the preferred option most people are going to use this week. I'm very fine with Ingram 3.4K, regardless of Zay Jones's final status. Should have had a touchdown last week. I was talking about that when you were getting your Wi-Fi up back together, but I still think he just straight up got the two feet down. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, you know, it was a center meter off. But if that would have scored, I think he would have easily been in the 4K range. The offensive environment in Jacksonville is great. He's the undisputed lead tight end. So very okay there with Evan Ingram. And then if you do want to get up to Hawkinson, I mean, I think your point, not having Swift in the Monra makes a lot of good sense there. David Njoku, right there in the middle of him, he's not, he doesn't have an injury designation, but he was randomly downgraded to a DMP on Thursday with the knee. So they have Harrison Bryant there. They obviously are going to flow the offense through Amari Cooper first and foremost. I'm concerned enough about Njoku just maybe not being quite as involved as usual to go ahead and take Evan Ingram over him when you could argue Ingram should have the higher kind of projection in the first place. Yeah, I want to throw in Njoku uh, just came out. He it was taken off the final injury report for today, if people were uh, looking at that. Literally just came across, so I uh, don't think Ian doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, all right, tournaments, tight end. You've got a couple of flyers on, like Mark Andrews. If the, we- if the weather in this game turns ugly, what like Josh Allen can rip it through the wind, right? Can, can Lamar rip it through the wind to, to Mark Andrews? Andrews is what the fourth highest owned tight end. You've got Kyle, Kyle Pitts week finally happened the one week this year. We might, we got Kyle Pitts week. Uh, That was last week, Ian. We'll have to see if it's a repeatable uh, projection for him. He's 5k. You could always throw darts at the tight end position. I think it's the one spot. I mean, outside of Mark Andrews, like he could, he could beat everyone by 10 or 15 fantasy points. But outside of that, if he doesn't come through, it's a crapshoot. I mean, this is like a position I worry about the least this week. 
By the way, I want to retract my Lamar over one and a half passing touchdowns with news on the weather. We take new information and we change our opinions. Every <laughs> month. So just going to take that one away, you know, before we get into the weekend. It's Darren Waller, man. 5.6K for a guy that dropped two touchdowns last week, had a 30-yard catch nullified on penalty, and had another 30-yard catch go off his outstretched fingertips. So Raiders are another offense where Renfro is probably going to be out again. Even Foster Moreau is probably going to be out this mm-hmm. week, man. So Devontae Adams, I understand they're going to try to get him going, but Darren Waller, you know, someone that, again, just we know how good Darren Waller is. Last week was horrific. I fully realize that. Let's not let one week completely cloud our judgment on this. 5.6K, he's not getting any sort of ownership, at least in terms of what I'm seeing right now, because I think people are going to want to either go up to Andrews or just go down to Pitts or that 4K range where you got guys like Hawkinson, like Zach Ertz, and like Dallas Goddard, where they think they could get some more targets. So I know Waller on the course of a season, maybe doesn't have as high as upside as past years when you have everyone healthy, but you take away the number two tight end and Renfro man who are really week to week, arguably two of the top four uh, options in that passing game. I think this could be a huge Darren Waller game. All right. That's going to wrap it up for the pro football focus show again. Sorry for my internet difficulties. It was out of my control. Uh, tune in next week uh, for the week five edition. Other than that, Ian, it's been a blast. Thanks for watching, everybody. Click the like button on your way out on YouTube. Subscribe wherever you find this, either YouTube, podcasts. Uh, Other than that, have a good week for everybody. For Ian, I'm Britt. Thanks for watching, and we out you.